Hi, my name is Carmen Starnino, and I'm the poetry editor at Vehicle Press. This event, and specifically how you're experiencing me now via an, on, via an online platform called StreamYard, is a measure of how much has changed over the last seven months. The story of 2020 from the perspective of the publishing world is the story of canceled events, disrupted industry functions, empty offices. I remember vividly our discussions at VQ as we took stock of how quickly things were unraveling and scrambled to salvage our spring list. It forced us to try new things and retrench our efforts to innovate in a world where bookstores were temporarily shuttered and, the, and global activity almost all at once moved online. But there were books that never got their full due as we pivoted to adapt to the new circumstances. In our case, that included our spring poetry, Joe Fiorito's All We Have Learned Is Where I Have Been, and Sadika Di Meyer's The Outer Ward. To be fair, the books received generous notices and enjoyed lots of social media attention. But I felt badly that we never officially marked their appearance in the world with a launch. These kinds of rituals are important and shouldn't be discounted. Indeed, what the pandemic has taught us is that there are things we should be sentimental about. But my regret was sharpened by the realization that both collections, with their themes of survival, misfortune, and resilience, spoke credibly to our present moment and the new reality of social distancing and quarantines. If there is such a thing as pandemic lit, these two books belong on that shelf. So it seems appropriate that we're finally, belatedly, celebrating two poets who I believe can help sum up some of what we've just gone through and vaccines are not what we will likely keep going through for the foreseeable future. Before we start, I want to let you know that we've partnered up with two great bookstores. So if you're in Toronto and you want to get a signed copy of Joe's book, drop by Ben McNally. He's got a bunch of them. And if you're in Kingston, head to Novel Idea, where there's a pile of Sadiqa's book, also signed. And if you're watching us from anywhere else in the country, please go to the vehicle site where you can get both books directly from us. We'll promise to get, get it to you in time for Christmas. Um, also, be sure to type in a question uh, wherever you're watching this, YouTube or Facebook, to win a chance at winning copies of these books. All right, let's get started. In those early weeks and months of the lockdown, I watched a lot of poetry being shared online. I did it too. And no surprise, it was a small way of exerting control over a situation where we felt so helpless. But it also became clear that the pandemic was forcing us to look for something different in our poems, um, hard-won clarity, a sense of moral stakes, an appreciation for the genuine. Sadiqa's poems have all of these qualities in spades, but she, is, she also brings to her lines a moving kinship with pain, both emotional and physical, and a sense of endurance that fortifies her against despair. The Outer Wards tells the story of mothering disrupted by illness. And that story is set inside a more radical and related disruption, the decentering and upending that comes from tending to small children. Both those subjects, illness and maternal duty, come together in a tender, astute, witty, and dazzling exploration of loss the loss of identity, the loss of long-standing notions of self, and the loss of traditional comforts and pleasures. In a way, Sadiqa's poetry arrives at that disorientation naturally. Born in Amsterdam into a family whose origins are Dutch, Kenyan, Pakistani, and Afghani, she moved to Canada as a child where she learned English. Even today, her writing shifts often spontaneously between English and Dutch. The experience of being a linguistic migrant is one she writes about brilliantly in her recent memoir, Alphabet, Alphabet, in which she, be and which she first began exploring in her poetry debut, Leaving Howe Island, published in 2013. The Outer Wards, the book we're launching tonight, is her second poetry collection, and one that, for me, secures her status as one of the most interesting writers in Canada. I feel privileged to welcome her tonight. Th thank you very much, Carmine. Um, and um, I would like to thank you back. It's, I think as any, any writer knows who's um, been lucky enough to work with Carmine, it's a real privilege to have um, your editorial eye. And so I want to thank you for taking the outer words um, 
and making it a, a better book. It's been great to work with you. I also want to uh, thank Simon and Jen at Vehicle as well. Um, it's a wonderful team. And thank you all of you who are watching tonight and listening. I know there are several other literary events that could have lured you away from this one this evening. And so I'm really pleased that you're here. Thank you. And um, what I'm going to read from The Outer Wards um, is the, the first poem, the last poem, and two in between. So the first one is called On, On Origins. Spoon, spoon, I too have a small version. I had one made in the meticulous workshop under my navel. They started with a fish, then frog, then rabbit, and I asked them to stop at human. Like you, we are head over heels when we look at each other. We go to sleep, concave, convex, in the room's particulate dark. Because I would know what to do with a cranium slowly gathering doubt. Good night, nobody. Good night, mush. Mornings were sprawled as if marooned. The next poem I'll read is the, the title poem, The Outer Wards. I saw that I would have to cross the river and that it was the rain. I had a fox, a goose, a sack of grain. I said, I love the gay men and kufias of the Rembrandt plain, and the muted half of me from a land of five converging waters with an upstream alphabet. So what makes me yours every night? Slow current, floodplain of drowning grass. Then the goose was in the reeds. It had an egg, twigs and quills, the ruckus of two pulses. The grain had blown into my field. Someone was claiming it. And the fox was a vanishing streak. I could take my name, but not my papers. I could take the swept air, but not my breath, or not in one load. My promises, but not the child I'd made them to, unless I could bring something back. But the weather, the barges, the clouds turning orange and rose. This poem is called Red Eye. Dear country, did you wait for me? Did you halt yellow trains as they vipered the engineered rural? Did you hinder currents, letting duckweed slowly lock the waters? Have you been a grand museum of immobile waterfowl and ruminants, flies on their nostrils, millipede, leaf, millipede life under leaf rot, stock still? Where it rained, did glass drops hover in a splintered universe of damp? Dear country, when I dropped the spindle, did you pull the mane? Did you arrest the motions of bicyclists, hooligans, vendors, classroom chalks, scraping and cursive, the past imperfect? Was there a static silence on all radios? Here is the private sea scrolling in, typing you an endless letter. The plane makes its fluid, plummeting turn and my window fills with land. Here is the clay that holds the brittle calcium of them who made me, have they waited? Because I waited for you in my blind and percolating marrow all the years I waited, sleepwalking, speaking a daft language flawlessly. Now the roads are ribbons and the cars begin to crawl. I would like to rise with you I'd like to be so awake. I've drunk repeated coffees from a small and unbreakable cup that a child might use to serve tea to a wiry monkey and a one-eyed bear. But I have left her in another country, sleeping, and my hands shake. The final poem of the book is called The, the Mother Shirt. Here it is. 
My selves hang like shirts that were skins. Now I am raw and peaceful. Life washes over me elementally, wave after wave. Idle sleeves. The writing shirt has a crumpled note in its pocket, but the ink has bled, illegible blue. The nostalgic shirt is embroidered, becoming. The scared one still quakes, damp under the arms. The mother shirt is magnificent, stained with blackberries and tempera paint. Oh, but it moves. There is someone in it, small limbs straining in the membrane trap. I pull it over her head and we laugh, falling on the bed together. Sweet eruption that goes on a little too long, like the signal after the slow shuttered train has gone. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Thank you, Sadika. Um, if you played poker with Joe Fiorito, you know something about his gaze. It's a little more than a poker face. It's a steady, silent, intense watchfulness. It's a gaze that doesn't give anything away, but devours everything it rests on, absorbing information. During a game, he's reading the table, sizing of players, studying body language. When you play against him, you feel his gaze full on, taking your measure. It's a gaze that notices everything and forgets nothing. And if you get the sense that I lost a lot of money to him over the years, you'd be right. It was that gaze he used when he wrote the food column in the 1990s that turned him into a cult figure in Montreal. Those pieces were collected in a book called Comfort Me with Apples. And it was that gaze he used when he began writing his columns for the Montreal Gazette, which made him a beloved mainstay of the city. Those were collected in Tango on the Main. And it was that gaze he used when he wrote his devastating memoir, The Closer, the Closer We Are to Dying, and when he wrote his novel, The Song Beneath the Ice, and when he wrote Union Station, a profound and thought-provoking letter to, to Toronto. Sorry, a thought-provoking love letter to Toronto. It was that gaze he put to work for almost 14 years, writing his column for the Toronto Star, reporting about what he called in an interview, the hard, dark corners and rough places of Canada's largest city. That gaze is everywhere in his gritty, spare, sharp poetry. Joe was patient in publishing his poetry debut, which appeared only two years ago when he was 70. All I have learned is where I have been, which we're launching tonight, is his second collection. Yet he has written poetry longer than he has written anything else. It's the prime mover, his first love, and his experience with it has informed every sentence he has put together. In fact, it's where I think his gaze comes from. It's in writing poetry that he first tested the ruthless clarity that is his signature sound. The skinny on Joe's poems is that they strike quickly and with astonishing precision. He doesn't write lines like anyone else because he doesn't need them to do what many of us need our lines to do, to comfort, to protect us from our fears, to inspire the love of readers. I'm not sure Joe wants to change anyone's life. He just wants to see the world as clearly as possible. And I'd now like to invite him to do just that. Carmine, uh, tonight uh, my gaze reveals only my love for you. Um, my job as a journalist, my inclination as a human being is to wander around and report and to tell people what I saw. And that kind of um, uh, informs everything I do. It, it's um, this book, as Carmen mentioned, is kind of um, it's a long book. It ranges over a lot of time and a lot of place. I'm just going to jump right in with two Northern Ontario love poems. Lake Superior Lament. The cock on the rooftop stiffens and spins. The clouds close in like lips. At the foot of the hill is the lake licking the bellies of ships. The waves are as blue as the mountain. The sky is as blue as the lake. And I am as blue as the cold waves are for your sake. Lake Superior Lament number two. I knelt and held her narrow hips. Night shift, Durham wheat, newsprint, red ore spilled into ships. I kissed her narrow foot, her swollen lips. Pop tumble in the barking drums in the mill beside the lake. 
She shivered in the motel light as if she knew a heart, not hers, but mine, would break. Uh, I mentioned place, that's Egan Street in Port Arthur. Um, the next poem I'd like to read, um, this is a, a poem about flying back to Northern Ontario uh, after I'd been away for a long time to attend a funeral. Row 17, seat A. The field below is green, is filled with random stones. Each spring, the red dirt unearths new ones. A row of markers over a row of bone. The logic of the graveyard is apparent from the air. From the clouds, a ceremony of descent. I look down, falling. I cannot take my eyes from there. Um, one of the poets that I really like a lot, uh, I've always liked a lot, is uh, Tom Tom Wayman. And um, particularly, I don't think there are enough poems about work, so Wayman work, I don't know. These, these are my work poems, and they're Northern Ontario poems as well. Still life. The dog's skull in the woods. Ants had eaten their fill of dog. The skull was hot. The ants grown fat on dog secrets. The skull was white, the woods perfumed with heat. I held the dog's skull in my hand. Red ants and white teeth fell, too loose to bite. I brought that home from work with me. I still have it. It's on my wall over there. Um, another quick work poem. And this is a, a poem that came from working on the, the highways in Northern Ontario. Love song. Did I say that? I said that wrong. It's, it's a work poem, but it's called Love Song. Raven lifts a wing to wave away the hot, blunt grills of passing cars. I wave at you. Let me start that again. Raven lifts a wing to wave away the hot, blunt grills of passing cars. I wave at you. Raven struts on a dead thing, plucking guts. I struck and plucked too. With my red, wet beak, I have black wings and I love you. I'm um, going to skip ahead a little bit here. And this is a poem, it's a poem I wrote for Goran Simic, uh, who lived through the siege of Sarajevo. Of the siege, he once wrote that he wanted to write poems like newspaper reports. When I was a columnist, I tried to write, write newspaper reports like poems. Here's the poem, here's the news, Balkan economics. The last time I saw sugar, it was $100 a kilo during the war, he said, stirring three spoons into his double-shot Americano. I spent a lot of time um, doing this paperwork by talking to people who are what you might consider on the margins. And sometimes people say things and do things and behave in a way that strikes you, not just as news, but as poetry as well. This is a poem about a rent strike, uh, successful, organized by some Her Hungarian Roma women. And the striking thing about this is that, first of all, they spoke up. Secondly, they didn't have their citizenship and their landlord was treating them badly and was going to evict them. So they held a rent strike. The Roma of Etobicoke. We don't need men. Our landlord hides from us and them. Or I need a man and can't find one. I taped my window pane. I flush with a bucket. My door won't close in the winter. I have no electricity in my bedroom. Laughs. Stops laughing. The next poem. This is the really hard part, is finding the damn things. This is the, in, a, in effect, the title poem of the book. It's called Little Sister Asleep. She on a kitchen chair, legs tucked up, short hair, grabbed me there. She died later, sniffing gasoline. All I have learned is where I've been. Thank you. That was great, Joe. Thank you. Um, we... Uh, we will have a little Q and A, and um, which means that the poets have to be. That's right. Here we go. Thanks, Jen. Um, and uh, we are going to wait for audience questions um, if they arrive. But before we uh, have any, I will kick it off. And I have a question uh, for Sadika. Um, 
and I will uh, get to the question um, by sort of mentioning this poem that um, I came across in your book, uh, your memoir, Alphabet, by someone named uh, Hermann de Koenig. Is that how you pronounce his name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, I'm going. It, it just. It, it just. The poem really struck me, and um, and so I I'd like to read it, and then I'm going to invite you to read it in um, Dutch, and then I, I will ask you a question about it. So um, the poem okay. is, I think, simply called Poetry. That's right, yeah. The way you say to a sick little daughter, my miniature human, my small homemade sorrow, and it doesn't help. The way you lay a hand on her white forehead as thinly as the snow lays down and it doesn't help. So poetry helps. Yeah, so that's right. So the Dutch version or the Flemish officially is um, poesie. Zoals je tegen een ziek dochtertje zegt, mijn miniatuur mensje, mijzelf gemaakt verdrietje, en het helpt niet. Zoals je een hand op haar witte voorhoofd legt, zo dun als sneeuw gaat liggen, en het helpt niet. Zo helpt poëzie. Ja, de poem, de poem struck me, particularly because, you know, in my intros, I, I try to weave in ideas of survival, resilience, and, and comfort, and, you know, um, the sort of the uh, what we looked for in poems, how how often they're the rate the rate and the you know the scale at which they were being shared online during during the lockdown, um, and I was just struck by that poem and that particular vision of comfort that it sort of expresses, and I'm I'm wondering how close that vision is to your vision of how your poems operate, um, and I just and I say it because it 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 it. It reminded me of a statement you made in an interview you gave to Maisonneuve, where uh, Maisonneuve magazine, where um, the question that was put to you was, "What lessons or comforts do you hope these poems, your poems, offer in this time?" And then you said, "I'm not sure. I expected the poems to be of comfort. Um, they were written almost as a witnessing of something painful, which, uh, which is, which is in itself kind of interesting." So I guess, I guess my question is like, what is your sense of, of uh, the idea of comfort in poetry and how do you think your poems operate um, um, in providing it? Yeah, thank you. I am, um, you, you're right that I, um, if, if some, some of the initial feedback actually that I got about the book, I was lucky to hear back from some community members did um, speak again about comfort. And um, I think some of, the word uh, a, a solace that's the word i remember that some of them found the poems to be of solace and um you're right that that's not the impression i had of what the book would do um but it was um it was a pleasant surprise that it did have that effect on some people and the re the reason is that um i i did feel that um not only did I not try to write towards um, comfort or reassurance, I think I at times even resisted that and was just trying to look exactly at the situation as it felt to me. What I realized afterwards and what I think um, ties in with what you observed about that small poem, which I love very much, that Dutch poem, um, which talks about how, you know, Basically, it's saying poetry doesn't help the way these small, tender gestures that you might make to a sick child aren't helping. They're not making the fever go away. Um, that's how that's how poetry helps. It. Um, so, so what I because so, because I mean, I guess what I love about that poem is that all of those gestures are gestures that you, you would want as a human. You want the you want that comfort, and you want yes. you, you know. Um, and so there's, yeah. there's just a, a, an interesting reversal. Um. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think what I'm coming around to a, a little bit um, in a roundabout way, but is I I think there's a quality of attention to those gestures. They are present to the daughter in that poem. Yeah. They're tender. And um, what what I've learned, I think, is that just paying that kind of attention maybe does bring people some sort of comfort, because I feel like that's perhaps the eye that the poems of the outer words 
out of words, turn on, on a difficult situation. And yet somehow that does, that there is a solace in just looking with that kind of eye. Joe, would you, would you agree? Um, <laughs> comfort the word that's always made me run in a kind of a different direction. Yeah. Because I don't, I don't see it and I don't take it easily. Mm. So, and while I value in, in my private moments, don't tell anybody as much comfort as the next person, I, I, it's just not, it's not what I tend to see. It's not what you tend to see from others or tend to see in your own work? Well, I like the short, sharp gesture. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of my work, I mean, I, I, I just consider myself an observer, uh, as somebody who wanders around, takes notes, and, and says, I was here. But I think a lot like, um, one of the things I remember about you, what happened when, when you retired your column, I think in 2017, is that um, you got a lot of comments about people who did find some comfort in your in your columns, who enjoyed them, who learned about the city that they were in, who learned about communities and corners of the city that they had probably never thought about. Um, maybe not quite, maybe comfort doesn't quite uh, sort of, communicate that but you did you did provide a kind of i don't know i help um, people with voice yeah. um and and when people are feel as if they've been heard um then they have a a measure of dignity and that was i think i would i would dignity is a pretty good word for me and dignity in terms of what what the poems are providing even the subjects that you write about what they witness and who they who they give voice to um and do you would you agree that that the that the poems are like the i mean i i said the poems are the prime mover was that was that me sort of like guessing or, or were the poems sort of the one of the first things you let me let me do a really deep dive on on where all of this stuff comes from um i have a a kind of a, a visual memory for things um and uh when I was poking around the city, uh, I would take copious notes so that I would have all of the dialogue and all of the settings and everything else, um, all of the conversations. But when I would go back to work, I wouldn't look at my notes until I had an image in my head of, of what I wanted to say. And then I wrote the columns towards that. That's a, a kind of a poet's approach to journalism. Um, as a poet, I think I was influenced by my family and 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 uh, the way I grew up ducking. <laughs> you you take note of your surroundings and and pay attention and 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 keep an eye out for nuance, and and you retain the memory so that you can recognize the pattern. And um, would you say? I mean, I'm just kind of curious as to how the poems informed. The journalism or if it worked the other way around or if it really was was a kind of like natural organic thing the practical answer is that um early on i learned economy in poetry economy is a journalist's best friend because you can get more stuff in than uh, somebody who writes with an awful lot of words or, or uses words wrongly um what was the question again Oh, where, where, which, which influenced what, 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 what? Uh, they both fed each other. Yeah. I, I was able to, I was able to use um, uh, all of the tools of literature in my column. Uh, n now I'm mining that column with uh, the tools of literature. And uh, the thing is, is, when you're trying to say something, it's, it's, it's this is sort of Rashomon through the years. Um, everybody here's something slightly different. Um, and, and I find when I go back to my notes, um, I can uh, not recast a voice, but I can remember the relationship between voices. And, and that's, voice is one of the things I want, not necessarily my voice in, in the poems, because they're a kind of imagery as well. Yeah. I'm not sure if I'm making any sense. Yes, you are. <laughs> but uh, Sadiq, I, I wonder if I can put the question to you as well. Um, with, what, if any, the relationship there is between the prose you write and the poetry you write. Um, what I was struck by reading the nonfiction book, the memoir, was um, how carefully and surprisingly you structured a lot of the scenes in that book. Um, 
and I felt I did feel the poet's hand and how you you were putting things together and what you decided to look at and the words you used. Um, the 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 prose moved quickly. There was a speed to it, um, um, and there was also, there was also a kind of density that um, the same density that I, I I often encounter in your in your poetry. I, I mean, do you do you see that relationship too? Is that does it, I mean, is what I'm saying make sense? Uh, yeah, it it does it does make sense to me. In fact, one of the things that I wish would go differently for me when I write prose is that I could write it faster and without um, the sort of attention to every phrase that I think comes with a background in poetry. Um, I'm not one to churn out five thousand words or to to write. I I do seem to be stuck on thinking about the language in in very small pieces yeah but on on the other hand i do i find um like, like the prose lets me think through things and i my poetry is not generally um a forum for that for me i'm not saying that it is uh entirely averse to to reasoning or but but i am in the poetry um i feel i'm working with with uh sound and atmosphere and image and a sort of, uh, I don't know, an emotional logic maybe. Whereas the, yeah, the prose seems, uh, offers me more of a, a linear way through through an idea. And Joe, would that hold for you too? Uh, yeah, I think pretty much, you know, um, the, uh, the, the functions are, the same but different uh, you know you you want to you want to translate the truth and and you want to translate the truth differently sometimes in different settings um and and if you're a writer worth her salt you write in various forms and 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 they have to inform each other because they're your voice they're your eyes they're your ears reflecting um showing the world back to itself um, it strikes me now that bo both these books are second books of poetry, um, and, and I'm curious as to what what that means to you, either of you. Um, Joe, did you? I mean, did this book did this book have the benefit of what you learned in the first book? Um, well, I, I think this book is. For me, it's an affirmation of the fact that I'm in the game, that I've left journalism and I'm doing something else now. It's, it's, uh, and it's an important book in that respect. Uh, it's an important book for me personally because I was able to capture some of my young poems and yeah. put them in my new voice and, and uh, happy that I was able. I'm trying to sort of perfect a way of saying, which is, you know, sparse and sharp and spare. And, and this is, it's getting me closer. Is there a reason you waited? You waited as long as you did. A guy's got to make a living. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Fair enough. Um, Sadika, was there anything from uh, the experience of working on your first book that that uh, you brought to your second? Well, um, I I don't know. I mean, you. You saw that manuscript as well a long time ago, and I wonder what your thoughts on that would be. I am, um, I mean, as Joe said, it's it's a it's a matter of of keeping the practice going, and then yeah. also getting uh, hopefully getting better, right? Refining your skills at what you do. And I, um, my second book is much more thematically coherent, and I feel that that has something to do with uh, being able to go deeper in uh, both both uh, as a skill, as, as a literary um, practice for myself, but also um, having to do with, with carving out that opportunity, as Joe alluded to again, to, you know, to have a life that has more room for writing practically and financially. Um, in that sense, this collection is a movement uh, into, into a deeper uh, place of work. Yeah. Um, I think we have questions. Um, Maybe four of them, four of them. So we'll, we'll just wait for them to. That's yeah. good. That's 50, 50 odds for a book for folks. Okay. From Susan to both. Um, what do you want your readers to experience or, 
or understand when they read or hear your poetry? Sadika? Um, hmm. I, I like not knowing. I mean, to be honest, Susan, it's, um, I, I suppose that it, the way that I write things, it's, it's fairly sonically based. I, th I think, you know, the way that maybe a child listens to a bedtime story, I'm not trying to infantilize the reader when I say that, but that, that sense of maybe being sort of having, having the full attention and being a little bit under the spell of something. I like that sense in, in the reader, but as far as what then to, to walk away with, I really like to, to be surprised by what that might be afterwards. Um, actually, can we see the, the question again? So, yeah, to both, what do you want your readers, this is for Joe, to experience or understand when they read or hear your poetry? Susan Mahoney should know that. I know her very well. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I just, I want people to see what I saw. I want people to see and, and react in as clear a way as possible to the things that I saw or that I heard, uh, so that and 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 that I can cast them in a kind of way without much more judgment than my own voice, so that when you see those things or say them to yourselves or hear them said to you, you'll get what I got. That's that's what I'm trying to do. It strikes me that you're both incantatory in your own ways, which is interesting. Um, okay, let's go. Let's do the second question, please. Um, has the world shift brought about by COVID changed either your work or your writing process? How or why not? Don is the smartest woman on Facebook. Um, <laughs> the uh, strangely enough, because I'm retired and because I've been working on on, uh, I haven't stopped writing. Um, not much has changed for me. Um, the only thing that's really changed is. Uh, I had a weekly date in the pool room once uh, uh, on Monday nights. So I don't do that anymore. So nothing, nothing really at this point has changed for me at all. Uh, it, in my case, um, I'm part of a writing group that we uh, we workshop our pieces with each other, and we used to meet biweekly, um, and even maybe every three weeks at times. And and now we meet weekly via via Zoom. Um, because we all kind of needed that more during this time. And um, that's been very helpful to me just to have that contact and have a weekly impetus to to submit something new. Um, and other than that, I have to confess, like probably there are a few more moments where I'm just sitting in front of the page or the screen with a head too full of other mm. other thoughts to, to work, you know, that has happened, um, but it's coming, yeah. Okay. Uh, Marky Severio, to Joe Fiorito, when you rhyme, I especially enjoyed Stone's ones, does it come naturally or do you labor over it? I love your rhymes. Great reading. Congratulations, Bella. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mark, um, uh, I think uh, I grew up in a musical household. I grew up listening to um, uh, pop music and 40s and 50s dance band kind of music being sung. Um, and, and I think that really informs what I do. I'm, try, I'm, tr I'm not a <laughs> Cohen, but I'm trying to write a kind of music of my own, uh, which I think every poet does anyway. Uh, do, I, do I labor over them? Yes. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, you, you, because you have to get it and get it and get it until you get, you get it right. Siddiqui, your rhymes, you rhyme as well. I mean, there's a great deal of internal rhyme um, in your poems. Um, mm -hmm. It's It doesn't, it never feels labored over. Um, Joe's doesn't either, yours doesn't. Uh, yours is a bit more surprising how it happens. Um, in the sense that like the, you, it's not, it's not expected. It's not part of a, a kind of formal structure. Right. Um, but it happens, and uh, and I feel like when it happens, you sort of know it's happening, and you use it. You sort of like, I mean, the thing with your poems that I find interesting is that they're they're very intuitive that way. The form feels very improvised, 
Um, like you get into the, the mood of it and then you follow the line and or the lines. And then if there's rhyme happening, you'll go with that. And then if when it stops happening, you'll sort of shift to something else. Um, but it is it are the rhymes important to you? Like, do you, are you happy when they happen or is it is it a um, is it is it part of what you sort of hope happens when you're writing? It's part of that the nursery rhyme effect. I feel that sometimes you. Right. Yes. Um, yeah, they they are. Um... They're not something I write to words, but I definitely do like it when they they seem to happen and fall into place. And actually, I've been reading Joe's book over the last week or two, and I agree. Like I found, we were sort of sonic. Uh, there was a kinship there with the what I was hearing, and um, that was really nice to to see. Um, I uh, I really love the work of Gwendolyn Brooks, who is a um, an incredibly skillful rhymer. And um, also, we'll just completely drop the rhyme when it no longer serves what she's doing. And so I suppose that's uh, someone who's uh, guided me in that direction. Mm, yeah, yeah, I love her work. Mm -hmm. um, I think we have one more question. Yeah, Mark Abley. Sadika, how is your poetry informed by Dutch? Joe, is your poetry informed by the, by the absence of Italian? Well, um, so Mark, this is the same question that I was asked um, a couple of times after my first book of poetry. And so I had to write this, I don't know if it's in the view, um, but that's essentially the, the book of essays that we briefly referred to is called Alphabet, Alphabet. And um, I wrote it because answering that question in um, a couple of interviews just felt, um, it felt so much like I was just speaking of, um, of the surface of something much, much bigger. And so um, I'm not trying to dodge your question, but I do feel that it's worth, it's worth uh, steering you towards the book because there's so much to say. Yeah, the, the short answer is a great deal. A great <laughs> I was deal. Before, there does, we go. A great deal, yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, by uh, the absence of Italian, I would, I would just simply say that, um, uh, you know, I'm the product of the generation that said to itself, speak English, get a job. So no, I don't speak Italian. They did. Um, but what I have is the rhythm of their voices. I, I, you know, I would sit in rapt attention because I had 11 aunts and uncles. And, and, and when they were gathering, you kind of want to sit in that gathering to see where you fit in this crowd and 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 you would just um again it's it's you you pick up rhythms so that you can talk like the people around you i think this is the last question um fred addis joe shaw was a theater critic turned playwright are you a poetry critic turned poet what poetry did you read um i'm uh, gosh, I'm not a critic at all. Um, uh, I will say that where it all starts from is is from um, those those two little imagist poems, the one about the uh, chickens and the red wagon in the rain, and the other one about the apparition of these faces in a crowd, petals on a wet black bough. Those are um, that's what I began reading. I began reading those images, and through those um, really classical poets, so to our poets, W.W.E. Um, Ross, for example, who um, uh, was really an adventurous writer. Uh, so I think, yeah, sure. Uh, the, the, it's, what I read, I read Imagists, and I began to understand the value of saying something with, uh, with an image. But no, I'm not a critic. Siddiqui, you, um, just picking up on Joe's uh, sort of inspirations or the, the sort of the, those, poets that kind of inspired him. Um, what would you say would be yours? I mean, I would think Elizabeth Bishop, Sylvia Plath, were those always the poets that sort of um, motivated you? Um, or, or, or were there earlier poets that, that, um, that you remember? Right. Um, yeah, so, so um, you're right that Plath and Bishop, um, especially in the current collection, The Outer Wards, were major influences and um that i work i worked a little bit with the contrast in their voices so plath's um 
extreme confidence and introversion and mythologizing of the self versus Bishop's um, reticence and sort of detailed outward looking view that she often takes. Um, but as far as other poets go, yeah, I, I mean, Gwendolyn Brooks has been an ongoing and, and major influence on me. Um, interestingly, a lot of the poets that I've read the most of, um, even though I made the transition to Canada at age 12, uh, have remained Dutch ones. And so, um, I mean, naming Ida Gerhardt and um, uh, Leo Fomam, others that come up in the, the book of essays are still sort of my foundational poets that I turn to um, most, which is probably also why sonically a lot of Dutch comes through in, in mm. my English work. Interesting. Um, I, we, we are ready to move to the winners, um, one for Outer Wards and one for All I Have Learned. And the winner for the Outer Wards is Mark de Severio. Uh, Mark, just email us at marketing uh, at vqpress.com um, and we'll send you the book. Um, and winner and winner for Joe's book, Don, Don Quelch. Don, um, just email us at the, at the email address that's there and we will uh, um, get the prize to you right away. This was great. Thank you, guys. I'm glad we finally did this. I'm glad we were able to fit this in for the end of the year. Um, and uh, just also want to say how tremendously proud I am of these books. Um, um, uh, very, very happy that you trusted me with them. Um, and I'm glad we were able to sort of, sort of uh, give them a... Um, a send off um, before uh, before the new year clicked in. Thanks very much. Thank you. So we um, just uh, just a quick word to everyone in the audience that um, these two books are still are obviously still available at Ben McNally's if you're in Toronto um, and you uh, would like a copy of Joe's book, um, and if you're in Kingston, um, novel idea. Um, is where you go if you want a copy of Sadiqa's book. If you're anywhere else, um, email us. Uh, come to go to the Vehicle Press website, and we will um, take care of you. Uh, we'll we'll send you copy copies of the book um, with in the same day. We are very quick. Um, thank you to everyone. Um, thanks for joining us, and uh, hope to see you at the next event. Good night.